I know uh, how it feels to be in a conference like this. Sometimes it can be an information overload, like taking a drink out of a fire hydrant. But that's, but that's life, isn't it? Uh, I hope and uh, pray that you guys have enjoyed uh, what you've heard so far. Today, class, um, this evening rather, we'll uh, look at uh, Christology. Christology, the doctrine of the person and the work of Christ. The doctrine of the person and work of Christ. So let's begin today by looking at this very important uh, loci in systematic theology, uh, which deals with this very important uh, topic of the person of Jesus Christ and his work. Now, obviously, um, it's hard to um, give you everything about this doctrine in a 50-minute lecture. So I'm just going to highlight uh, um, the most important things I think you should know about this doctrine. So here's the outline of our study uh, for this evening. We'll begin by asking the question, who is Jesus Christ? And in response to that, I'd like to survey a few um, non-Christian views of Jesus Christ and uh, then look at the answer that Jesus Christ himself gives about himself. Uh, then I'm going to introduce you to the classical approaches to the study of Christology. How has this doctrine been studied in the history of the church? Uh, we'll look at at least two different ways uh, this doctrine has been broached in the history of the church in terms of how one um, goes about studying this doctrine. And then I'm going to introduce you to uh, three titles for uh, Christ. Many titles uh, Christ has. You probably know that Christ is the most titled person in all of history. But today we'll just look at three titles uh, due to time constraints. And then we'll end our session, uh, the Lord willing, uh, by looking at uh, the threefold office of Christ. This is often referred to as a mediatorial function or the mediatorial functions of our Lord Jesus Christ. How is Christ our prophet, priest, and king? Okay, so this is the basic outline of our study for this evening. So let's begin by asking the most important question I think Jesus ever asked his disciples. In Matthew chapter 16, he takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, um, uh, as it were, from the hustle and bustle of the crowds. And then he uh, looks at them and says, who do people say that I am? And of course, uh, uh, his disciples began to um, give uh, answers. Uh, some say you're this, and some say you're that. Uh, one of the prophets, uh, Elijah, John the Baptist, and what have you. But then he personalizes that question. He says, he looks at his disciples and he says, who do you say that I am? And then, of course, Peter uh, responds with that great answer. But we'll wait for that answer. And I will talk about that answer in a few minutes. But who do you say that I am is a very important question that Jesus asked of his disciples. Why is this question so important? And why is it getting the answer to this question right so important? What's at stake if one rejects the true identity of Jesus Christ? What's at stake? Let's look at what Jesus Christ himself says in John chapter 8. Look at how he puts it. Here Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders of his day. And he's asking, uh, and he's, uh, con he's having a conversation with them. And he says to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you will, or you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, that is, I am from above, unless you believe that I am from above, what? You will die in your sins. What's at stake if you get this question wrong? Eternal separation from God, death in sin. For the wages of sin is what? And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what's at stake? Eternal separation. The very eternal destiny of a person that is at stake if you get this question wrong. So what we'll do very uh, briefly class is we'll survey a few non-Christian views of Jesus Christ and then we'll look at uh, what Jesus Christ has to say about his own identity, especially in the confession, after the confession of Peter in that uh, Matthew chapter 16 passage. Okay, what about Jehovah's Witnesses? Let's start off with the Jehovah's Witnesses. What do Jehovah's Witnesses have to say about the person of Jesus Christ? You probably know that Jehovah's Witnesses um, basically think of Jesus Christ as the first creation of God. Uh, this is basically a... Um, a variation of Arianism, right? You've heard of the doctrine, this heresy called Arianism in the early church. Arius very famously denied the deity of Christ. He said there was a time when Jesus Christ was not because he's a creature. And because he's a creature, he cannot be of the same nature as God the Father. Basically, this is Arianism in a morphed version. Um, Jesus Christ is viewed as Michael, the archangel. 
In fact, you probably know how the Watchtower Society translates John 1.1, 1, 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and how does the, trans how does the society, Watchtower Society translate the last phrase? The and the Word was? A God. A God. So they see Jesus Christ as a God, a semi-God, so to speak, inferior to God the Father. He is not God as in God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He is God in the sense of an inferior deity. He does not share in the same nature as God the Father. So this is, so this is basically Arianism uh, rehashed, as it were, mo a morphed version of, re, uh, of Arianism. Now, what about the Mormon view? Here's a slightly convoluted view now of Jesus Christ. Again, a very inferior view of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Uh, Mormons very famously claim that God the Father used to be a man on another planet. And he had many spirit children. In fact, Jesus Christ uh, is one of the many spirit uh, children of uh, Elohim, God the Father. And Lucifer is seen as a spirit brother of Jesus. Now, you probably know who Lucifer is. Like Lucifer, who is Lucifer? Yeah, this is Satan before the fall. So Lucifer, right? Uh, Jesus is a spirit brother of Lucifer. In fact, they, have also, they also have a rather weird understanding of the uh, incarnation uh, of Christ in terms of how his incarnation was made possible. You probably heard of Brigham Young, one of the well-known prophets and apostles of the Mormon church. He uh, very famously said, the man, and I quote, the man Joseph, the husband of Mary, did not, that we know of, have more than one wife. But Mary, the wife of Joseph, had another husband. In other words, they think of the conception of Jesus Christ as a union between God the Father and Mary. So you notice um, this is a very unique uh, understanding of the person of Christ, especially of the incarnation. Jesus as a spirit brother of Lucifer and that the incarnation being made possible through this union, physical union between God the Father and Mary. What about the Islamic perspective? Now interestingly, uh, Islam has a very high regard for Jesus Christ. Uh, in fact, when a traditional Muslim takes the name of Jesus on his lips or her lips, they would always um, uh, uh, um, add, may peace be upon him. Uh, the uh, Arabic uh, expression is uh, Musale Salam. Uh, sorry, Isa Le Salam, not Musale Salam, but Isa Le Salam. Isa meaning Jesus, as, uh, Saleh Salam meaning may peace be upon him. So Muslims have a very high regard and respect for the person of Jesus. Now, how do, the Mus how do Muslims conceive of Jesus, con uh, con uh, think of Jesus? Uh, Jesus was indeed a virgin-born prophet of God. He is a prophet of God, not the Son of God incarnate, but the prophet of God. Yes, he is virgin-born. And also, Muslims very famously claim, claim that Jesus did not die on the cross. It was somebody else who died on the cross. He was raised up to heaven like, any, uh, like the ancient prophets like Enoch or even Elijah. So Jesus uh, is um, a prophet, uh, a virgin-born prophet, uh, highly respected in Islam, but they would stop short of calling him the Son of God or God incarnate. Yes, he is also seen as a precursor to the Prophet Muhammad. In Islam, the greatest prophet is the Prophet Muhammad, and Jesus comes as a precursor. Uh, so Islam does have high regard for Jesus, but so far as uh, it conceives of Jesus as a prophet, but not as the Son of God. Now, what about uh, the liberal Christian perspective? You've probably heard of Dan Brown, right? His uh, well-known work, uh, uh, The Da Vinci Code. And, in, in, and very famously, Dan Brown captures this idea of Jesus uh, uh, that many liberal Christians hold to. Jesus Christ was a good moral teacher, uh, but not divine. He was uh, a human being just like you and I, with like passions like you and I. Sadly, the church divinized Jesus. You probably know that in this well-known work of his that became quite popular a few years ago, he has one of the characters in this book say that the deity of Christ was established at the Council of Nicaea in 325 by a close vote. Now, those of you who know your church history know that this is not historically accurate. The deity of Christ was not established at the Council of Nicaea. It was affirmed at the Council of Nicaea. The church always believed in the deity of Christ. Many early Christians right from the get-go gave their lives for this belief. The earliest confession of the church was Jesus is Lord. In fact, we'll talk about it. And of course, when it comes to the vote, you probably know uh, what the vo vote was. It was 316 to 2. That's not a close vote. And these two Arian bishops were kicked out. So. <laughs> So you know that uh, uh, that's not a historically accurate statement. That's why it's so important for you as a Christian to know uh, church history and to learn about your, the history of your faith. 
So, uh, so we have liberal, uh, uh, quote unquote, Christians claiming that Jesus Christ was indeed a great moral teacher, uh, but he was not divine. The church sort of projected its uh, idea of divinity upon Jesus, but he was, that's how many liberal uh, Christian scholars, they call themselves Christian, by the way, many liberal, quote unquote, Christian scholars uh, like to see Jesus in that light. Now, you probably heard of New Age, right? New Age has become quite popular nowadays. Uh, this is a very uh, pro popular movement, especially in Hollywood. Uh, uh, probably the most vocal proponent of uh, New Age uh, teaching uh, in our uh, context today is a man by the name of Deepak Chopra. Anyone heard of this guy, Deepak Chopra? Deepak Chopra perhaps is the most uh, vocal and the most visible proponent of this idea of New Age. I like how Ravi Zacharias, the, the Christian apologist, puts it. He says, New Age uh, is an old bird with a new walk. Basically, it's Hinduism uh, recast or uh, uh, Hinduism repackaged for the Western palette, so to speak. And so, uh, very famously, um, uh, uh, Deepak Chopra, in his uh, latest book uh, that he's written on Jesus, called The Third Jesus, uh, talks about uh, the fact that there are three Jesuses, and we need to be aware of each of these three Jesuses. He calls the first Jesus the, hist the Jesus of history. He says we don't really know the Jesus of history really because uh, the Jesus of history has been swept under the pages of history and so we don't know much about him. Now the second Jesus is the Jesus of the church. Now the problem with the Jesus of the church is that uh, these uh, early Christians were quite zealous uh, uh, because they were influenced by this Jewish concept of the Messiah and so they basically took this concept of the Messiah and applied it to this, this guy called Jesus who was a great teacher and taught with great power and authority but the church convoluted as it were the truth in doing that but what's more important is not the history of the Jesus of history or the Jesus of the church what's important is the, G the cosmic Christ that's what's important for us he says why because this cosmic Christ gives us God consciousness. He gives us God consciousness. Look at how he puts it, the third Jesus. And finally, he says, there is the third Jesus, the cosmic Christ, the spiritual guide whose teaching embraces all humanity, not just the church built in his name. He speaks to the individual who wants to find God as a personal experience to attain what some might call grace or God consciousness or enlightenment. Now, you probably need to know the background to uh, Deepak Chopra's teaching. And Deepak Chopra comes from a pantheistic worldview, right? Uh, what's a pantheistic worldview? Anyone tell me? God. Everything is God. Everything is divine. There's no distinction between the creator and the creation. The creation basically is an emanation from the being of God. So in Hinduism, especially in the practice of yoga, some of you might know that, uh, that there is a mantra that is often said in yoga. And it's a one word mantra in Sanskrit. And the mantra is Om. You keep repeating that word over and over again. The word Om in Sanskrit simply means I am. So when you keep repeating yourself, you're basically reminding yourself that, that you're one with this universe and this universe is one with God and therefore you're essentially one with God. Very famously Deepak Chopra said that you and I are gods and goddesses in the state of self-forgetfulness. So in order to realize who we are, we need the help of the cosmic Christ who gives us God consciousness. And so in repeating this mantra over and over again, you are reminding yourself that you're one with this universe and this universe is one with God and therefore you're essentially, you are essentially divine is, what is, uh, is how it's understood. So New Age Jesus is the cosmic Christ who gives us God consciousness and enlightens us to, our true, uh, uh, to, our, to the true understanding of who we really are, that we are indeed gods and goddesses. Now, so here we are very quickly surveyed uh, a few uh, interesting views, uh, unorthodox <laughs> views rather, about Jesus Christ. Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Jesus Christ is the first creation of God. Mormons, Jesus is a created being, the <coughs> spirit brother of Lucifer, conceived by the sexual union of the father and Mary. Islam, Jesus as the virgin born prophet of God. Um, liberal Christianity, Jesus a great moral teacher but not divine. New Age Christianity, Jesus is indeed the, we need to, uh, forget about the history of the his historical Jesus or the Jesus of the church. What we need to pay attention to is a cosmic Christ, the cosmic Christ who gives us God consciousness. So in the light of what we've just read, let's look at this very important passage in Matthew uh, chapter 16 and look at how Jesus uh, asks this very important question of his disciples. Let's read Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 through 14. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, 
who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Look at how he personalizes that question. Who do you say that I am? And of course, impetuous Peter, as always, Simon Peter replied, you, you, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what did Jesus do? He said, Peter, you are a genius. You never cease to amaze me, Peter. Is that what he said? <coughs> Look at what he said. He pronounces a divine benediction on, on Peter. He says, and Jesus answered him and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for what flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. How do we understand or come to the realization of the true identity of Jesus Christ? Is it through human revelation or divine revelation? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but what? My Father who is in heaven. So, very important to keep that in mind, that we come to the realization of the true identity of Christ by divine revelation, by God's assistance. No one can say Jesus is Lord except with the help of the Holy Spirit, right? Now, of course, we just looked at John 8 right now, where, which, earlier where he said, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So we have the great confession contrasted with the great warning. So we know that if we miss and uh, misunderstand the person and the, uh, and the true identity of Jesus Christ, the implications are, uh, are devastating. Uh, eternal separation from God. Okay, with that in mind now, let's begin by looking at this question of who is Jesus. The very first question the church answered, uh, asked and answered was this question, who is Jesus? You probably know this, but uh, let me repeat this. Uh, do you know that the earliest church's confession was simply uh, a very, a three-letter confession, basically? Jesus ho kurios, Jesus is Lord. Uh, simplest confession. In fact, scholars tell us that that's what uh, uh, Paul was quoting in Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Simple confession. Jesus is Lord. And many Christians gave their lives uh, for uh, this confession. Why? Because back at that time in the first century, uh, I guess in this case you would, you would say, uh, if give, to give you a concrete example, Nero set the stage, as it were, for this rather shaky relationship between the church and the state. And uh, you probably know what a sadist N uh, Nero was. Uh, and he did all kinds of uh, 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 torturous things to Christians. You probably know that probably the most famous thing he did was he would have Christians uh, uh, pitched in tar, so to speak, coated in tar, tied to stakes uh, in his garden and lit, as it were, uh, to serve as human torches while he dined in his palace. So, um, uh, and of course, the other way of torture was uh, 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 basically using them as, uh, as, uh, uh, as, as, as food for the beasts in the Circus Maximus. And so, uh, brutally, many Christians were killed. Why is that so? They were willing to die for their faith because they would not say or confess the required confession of their day. Caesar is Lord. For them, it was Jesus who was Lord. And so they died for their faith. And the earliest church's confession, as you probably know, was that three-letter confession. In fact, you know that one of the most important uh, councils in the history of the church was the first ecumenical council called the Council of Nicaea that took place in 325. And here, for the first time, you see the church coming together to um, express uh, its faith in creedal language in terms of how it believed in the Trinity. Uh, we believe in God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And at that particular stage, we notice how this uh, uh, heresy called Arianism was really uh, wreaking havoc in the church. Arius very famously denied, uh, uh, openly denied the deity of Christ because he said Jesus Christ was the first creation of God, and therefore it could not be of the same nature, of the same substance as God the Father. And of course the church uh, quenched Arianism as it were at 325 and basically affirmed that Jesus Christ was of one nature with the Father. He was homo osionto patri, as the Greek expression goes. That became the shibboleth of orthodoxy at that time in the, at the Council of Nicaea, 325. Christ is of one nature. 
He is consubstantial with God the Father. He is of one nature. He is not like the Father or similar to the Father. He is of one substance, of one nature with the Father. So the church was very adamant about this uh, truth that it confessed right from the get-go that Jesus Christ is Lord, meaning He is divine. He is one with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Then, of course, uh, the second uh, council that was another watershed moment in the history of the, uh, history of the church was a council that took place in 451 uh, at, the city of Cal at the city of Chalcedon. Um, this is often referred to as the Council of Chalcedon, a very important uh, uh, council that dealt with the, the doctrine of, uh, uh, of Christ, Christology. And here we have, in these four uh, statements, how the church refuted uh, uh, a particular heresy. For example, we notice the church uh, affirmed these four statements about the person of Christ, that number one, he is truly divine, Number two, he is truly human. Number three, he has two distinct natures. And number four, he is one person. In fact, in the, in the history of the church, uh, until up to, uh, up, up to this time, we notice that the church was basically dealing with certain heresies. So it goes back, as it were, in, the, in its history and says very clearly that this is what we believe about Christ, about Jesus Christ and his person. So in stating Christ is truly God, it was basically undermining the, the heresy called Arianism. Christ is truly God undermines Arianism. Secondly, Christ is truly man. There was a man by the name of Apollinarius. Some of you might have heard of Apollinarius and his heresy. Now, Apollinarius was indeed an, uh, a defender of Nicene Orthodoxy, but his answers about the person of Christ fell short. When he talked about the humanity of Christ, he very famously suggested that the divine logos replaced the human soul in Christ, that Christ had a human mind. And so um, his answer sort of fell short of that. And the church rejected that idea that the divine logos somehow replaced the human mind of Christ. And it affirmed that Christ truly was human. To be truly human means to have a body and a rational soul. And so the church affirmed that Christ was truly human, meaning he had a body and he had a rational soul. And thirdly, there was a, heres a heretic called uh, Eutychus, E-U-T-Y-C-H-E-S. Eutychus very famously uh, confused the two natures. He said, yes, before the incarnation there were two natures, but after the incarnation there was one nature. And this one nature is an amalgam, a mixture of the two natures. Eutychus, uh, and this heresy is called Eutychianism, right? So he confused the two natures of Christ and said there was only one nature after the incarnation. Yes, two natures before the in incarnation, but after the incarnation, one nature. And this one nature is a union of the divine and the human and the church rejected that and said no Christ is truly human and truly divine which means he has a true human nature and a true divine nature so the church affirmed that Christ has two distinct natures and then of course there was there was another her uh, heretic by the name of Nestorius Nestorius sadly was a rather muddled headed thinker and he used language that didn't quite help his cause so when he talked about Christ he sort of flip-flopped between, between the human and the divine almost using language that suggested there were two subjects in Christ or two agents in Christ, basically dividing the divine from the human in Christ. Now, we distinguish between the humanity and the divinity of Christ, but not divide the humanity from the divinity in Christ, okay? So this guy used language that basically divided the person of Christ. So the church rejected that teaching and said Christ is one person. So. In 451, when the church came together at this very important council, it affirmed these four statements about Christ, which become you know, the, what we would call the essential criteria for Christological orthodoxy. We all affirm that Christ is truly God, he is truly man, he has two distinct natures, and he is one person. Now, how has the church uh, uh, approached this very important doctrine of uh, Christ? Um, the usual uh, classical approach has been uh, looking at Christ, um, the doctrine of Christ, either starting with his humanity or divinity. It's often referred to as a Christology from above approach, Christology from below approach. Either you begin with uh, talking about the deity of Christ and then you account for his humanity, or you begin with the humanity of Christ and then you account for his deity. Right? So either you start with ab uh, from above meaning deity, below meaning humanity. So generally that has been the classic approach uh, when, uh, with regard to the study of this doctrine. Christology from above and Christology from below and vice versa. Now, after the Reformation, the Reformers preferred to go with this approach, a three-pronged approach to the study of Christology. They basically would talk about the names of Christ, the states of Christ, and the offices of Christ. The names, the states, and the offices of Christ. The names of Christ basically have got to do with the titles of Christ. Christ is the most 
titled person in all of history. Uh, we also have the idea uh, uh, about the states of Christ. The states of Christ refers to his ontology, right? Ontology meaning his being, his pre-existence. Before Abraham was born, I am, right? Christ pre-existed his birth in Bethlehem, didn't he? So we talk about the pre-existence of Christ. We talk about the incarnation. The ascension is going to do with this uh, resurrection and uh, leaving, as it were, this, uh, the earth. And the session literally means in Latin, sitting. So this refers to him now sitting at God's right hand. So the states of Christ deal with his pre-existence, the incarnation, ascension, and session. Uh, today we'll be looking, uh, the Lord willing, at the offices of Christ. This has got to do with the mediatorial functions of Christ because the very um, word Christ, as you probably know, simply means what? Anyone know what the word Christ means? Anointed the anointed one, right? Simply meaning what? What's the anointed? Christ is another word for what? Messiah, right? So he is a Messiah. And how does a Messiah, uh, how does the Bible talk about the Messiah? We know the Bible talks about the Messiah as being a prophet, that the Messiah was going to be a priest, and the Messiah was going to be a king. So we'll see how Christ, our Lord, functions uh, in this mediatorial uh, role as our prophet, priest, and king. So let's begin very quickly by looking at these three titles uh, that are applied to Christ. The Son of Man, Lord, and Christ. Now, <coughs> And then, of course, we look at Christ as our mediator, the threefold office of Christ, prophet, priest, and king. Let's look at the first uh, title, the Son of Man. Now, uh, you probably know that um, Jesus used um, this title to refer to himself more than any other title in the history uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in New Testament literature. When you look at uh, the gospel records and you look at the titles that Christ used to describe himself, this is by far the most frequently used title that he used to describe himself, the Son of Man. Um, the title Christ um, is the most frequently used uh, title that New Testament authors used for Jesus, right? So Christ is the most frequently used title by New Testament authors for Jesus. And Lord is the second most frequently used title by New Testament authors for Jesus. So the most frequently used title that Jesus used to describe himself, Son of Man. The most frequently used title that New Testament authors used to describe Jesus, Christ. The second most used New Testament uh, title for Jesus by New Testament authors rather uh, is uh, Lord. Okay, so uh, Son of Man is a, is a title that Jesus used to refer to himself more often than any other title. Sometimes the title uh, Son of Man can be misunderstood to refer to his humanity because, you know, Jesus is also called the Son of God. So we think when Jesus uses the title Son of Man, one would think normally this refers to his humanity, but not necessarily. Uh, although etymologically speaking, you can say the Son of Man does have you know, uh, the idea of, uh, of him being uh, human in terms of his uh, humanity, but uh, if you look at it, it's an enigmatic title and actually has roots in apocalyptic literature. So what I want to do is very quickly um, show you three important uh, ideas from scripture about this title, Son of Man. Um, we'll notice in Daniel chapter 7 in a few minutes that the Son of Man is actually referred to as, the heavenly, as a heavenly being whose sphere of operations is in heaven. And then I'm going to show you from Matthew chapter 9 how Jesus uses this title to refer to himself and he forgives sin. The Son of Man has authority to forgive sin. And of course, in Mark chapter 2, we look at the fact that the Son of Man is called the Lord of the Sabbath. And all of these instances we notice Christ is communicating to his audience or to his readers, or to, his, uh, to his hearers rather, that uh, this title is not a title of humanity, but actually a title of his divinity. And we'll see why. So let's begin by looking at Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 10. Uh, 9 and 10. Now here's a description of the vision that Daniel saw. Here God enabled Daniel to look as it were into the very inner sanctum of heaven and this is what he saw. I'm going to read for you this, these two slides uh, that uh, basically contain uh, the passage from Daniel chapter 7. As I looked, says Daniel, thrones were placed, the Ancient of Days took his seat, his clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure, like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its uh, wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came f out from before him. A thousand thousands served him and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. So here we have the, white, uh, the great white throne judgment happening, so to speak, where the Ancient of Days, God is now seated 
and the court is adjourned, so to speak, and the books are op have been opened. So, uh, and he goes on to say, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, um, uh, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So here we have the Ancient of Days, God sitting on the throne, and the Son of Man ascending in a cloud, as it were. We, this is often referred to as a Shekinah cloud, right? Uh, ascending, and he's presented to the Ancient of Days. And look what happens. And to him was given a dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages serve him. So here we have the idea of the ascension of Christ to whom now authority and power has been given. So in other words, what I want to suggest is here, is this. Daniel saw the exaltation of Jesus Christ. The Son of Man is a being whose sphere of operations is in heaven. Why do we say that? Because <coughs> Jesus Christ, our Lord, left the presence of the Ancient of Days in heaven. He became incarnate and returned to his place of origin to be given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. We know that in, uh, in Acts chapter 1, Luke describes the scene for us of uh, Jesus' ascension into heaven. Do you know how he describes the scene? Look at how he puts it in Acts 1, uh, 9. And when he said these things, they were looking, looking on, and he was lifted up in a cloud. And a cloud took, out, took him out of their sight. So what we see here is, Jesus, is Luke describing for us Jesus' departure. What Daniel sees is the arrival of Christ in heaven. Luke talks about the departure of Christ, the Son of Man ascending in a cloud of glory. And what Daniel sees is the exaltation of Christ, the arrival of the Son of Man in the presence of the Ancient of Days. So Luke describes the departure, Daniel sees the arrival. In fact, Jesus himself says in John 3, right, what does he say? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. So he, when he uses this title, he does use this title enigmatically to refer to his deity, not to his humanity. In fact, there's another example here in um, Matthew chapter 9, where he is very clearly communicating to his audience that he is indeed God. Look in Matthew chapter 9, the instance of the paralytic, right? You notice where this uh, paralytic is brought to Jesus, and he says, Jesus looks at him and he says, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus unilaterally pronounces divine forgiveness. Now, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of a first century Jew and hear this for the first time. See, you and I are so used to people, at least in, in the church, uh, our ministers and pastors uh, pronouncing forgiveness on somebody who confesses their sin. Now, we are so used to it, but put yourself now in the shoes of a first century Jew and hear this for the first time. Here's a man being brought to Jesus and Jesus looks at him and his situation and he says, take heart my son, your sins are forgiven. Look what happened as soon as he said that. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, this man is what? Why do they think they said that? Who can forgive sins? God and God alone. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. The Son of Man has authority on earth to what? Forgive sins. He said to the par paralytic, Take, uh, uh, Rise, uh, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and he went home. And when the crowd saw it, they were afraid and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. So all this to say, the only person who can forgive sins is God and God alone. And this statement of Jesus is not a statement of humility. Now, the last passage uh, on, on this title, the Son of Man. Jesus on the Sabbath, uh, on, in this particular instance, we notice Jesus basically taking, uh, uh, basically uh, uh, communi communicating the fact that he has authority uh, over the Sabbath because he, is a, he himself is the Lord of the Sabbath. Notice in Mark 2, one Sabbath he was going through the grain fields and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And when the Pharisees, uh, and the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are you doing this? What is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what, G what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him. Now he entered the house of God in time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And also he gave it to those who were with him. 
And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So here Jesus is basically saying that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Who has authority to, uh, uh, to, uh, to who has authority over the Sabbath except the Lord himself? And basically in saying the Son of Man has authority of the Sabbath is basically saying the Son of Man is God. So here Jesus is claiming to be divine and is using this rather enigmatic title to communicate that. So this title Son of Man is not a title that basically talks about his humanity but actually talks about his divinity. Although etymologically speaking one can uh, understand that this title Son of Man can mean or, or connote his humanity but he uses this title very enigmatically uh, to refer to his deity and these passages clearly communicate that idea to us. What about the title Lord? Moving rather quickly here, in the New Testament the title Lord is used at least in three different ways. Uh, how is the title Lord used in the New Testament? The first use is that of a polite form of address, right? When, uh, for example, when some people approach Jesus, people who do not know him would often refer, refer to him as kurios. That does not mean they called him Lord. The word kurios means Lord, by the way. It does not mean they recognize that he was divine uh, because the word kurios or the title kurios is a, uh, is a polite form of address. You politely and respectfully address somebody as kurios, just like Paul did on his road to Damascus. It can also me have mean, uh, it can also have a, also connote what we would call a formal title of dignity and respect. This was usually uh, given to people who owned slaves and who were wealthy slave owners back in the New Testament uh, days. In fact, Paul loved to address himself as the doulos of the Lord. Doulos meaning a uh, slave of the Lord. And basically, that simply means that he was a unique possession of his master, Jesus Christ. So we as Christians are indeed doulos, or douloi rather. Douloi plural, doulos singular. So we are indeed uh, uh, a unique possessions of our Lord. He paid a price. To, uh, to redeem us, as it were, and redemption did cost the Lord something. But of course, sometimes in the, in the New Testament we'll notice that kurios uh, can also be used as a supreme title of dignity and respect. This is the title that Jews, the Jews, uh, or the Jewish community, or, or, and even early, Christian, uh, early Jewish Christians used for, uh, for God. Uh, they would not say the divine name because they were afraid that they would be breaking the commandment of the Lord. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. So they would uh, instead say Adonai. Instead of saying Yahweh, they would say Adonai. And so they would uh, avoid pronouncing the divine name. So they used this title uh, Kurios in Greek uh, for the divine name. And so they refrained from taking the divine name on their lips. And so they said instead they would use Kurios. And this title was applied to Jesus. The same title that was applied to Yahweh in the Old Testament was applied to Jesus. So we notice that the term, uh, the title Kurios can have three different usages, but the last usage is indeed perhaps the most supreme usage used for Jesus. In fact, this is the same, this is the, this is the supreme usage as it were, the imperial usage of Kurios that we see in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is, in, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a serpent, servant, uh, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Notice in verse uh, 9, therefore God has highly exalted, literally in the Greek it reads, God has hyper exalted or super exalted, uh, uh, him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So what is the name? So that at the name of Jesus every knee should, knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is kurios, Lord, imperial usage. Uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So this title was a title that connoted great authority and supreme dignity and honor in terms of him being the very Lord of Lords. Then of course, perhaps the most uh, commonly used uh, title uh, for Jesus uh, by New Testament authors was the title Christ. We are moving rather rapidly because of our time here, but let me quickly uh, introduce you to this title Christ and then move on to the threefold office of Christ. Um, Christ simply meaning Messiah, the anointed one, Christ is the uh, Greek, uh, uh, is, uh, Christos is the Greek, Mashiach is the Hebrew, 
uh, Christ is English, right? So Christos, Mashiach mean the same thing, the anointed one. In the Bible, we notice that uh, there were three offices that required anointing, the office of the prophet, the office of the priest, and the office of the king. Now, the priest and the prophet and the king uh, were mediators. These were go-betweens, so to speak. Each had a unique role. Uh, they were anointed by God, they were set apart by God, and they were, and they were gifted by God. So these uh, uh, individuals, as it were, these uh, officers uh, were unique in the sense that they were called mediatorial officers. For example, the priest had a role, the prophet had a role, and the king had a role. What was the role of the prophet? The prophet basically was what? God's mouthpiece, right? He spoke on behalf of God. Whenever the prophet spoke, how did he say? Uh, how did he profess his, uh, uh, his prophecy? Thus saith the Lord. What about the priest? The priest too had an interesting role, uh, a mediatorial role. He spoke on behalf of the people. He prayed or interceded on behalf of the people. And of course, the role of the king was to govern and rule and protect God's people. So we notice Jesus fulfills each of these three roles, that he is our prophet, that he is our priest, and he is our king. So let me quickly introduce you to this office, the threefold office of Christ, often called in Latin the munis triplex. Munis triplex meaning the threefold office. Technically, it's one office. Uh, sometimes you'll notice uh, some theology textbooks talking about his offices, but technically there's one office. The word office refers to his work. Uh, and basically he, this refers to a, s a single threefold function of Jesus Christ. So let me quickly, uh, in the little time that we have, uh, wrap this up as we look at the three offices. Number one, we know the Bible talks about the fact that the Messiah was going to be a prophet. Uh, uh, Moses in uh, Deuteronomy 18 actually talks about the fact, uh, which is uh, quoted by Peter in his sermon in Acts. He says, uh, and um, uh, Peter quoting Moses says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me among you from among your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. We notice that Christ uh, is the one through whom God spoke. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 clearly communicates this very important idea to us. Long ago at many times, many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by whom? His son. His son. God has spoken to us through his son, whom he appointed as the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So we notice Christ was the one through whom God spoke. He is called the word of God. He is both the subject as well as the object of the, prophecy, of the prophecies in the, uh, in the Bible. He is through whom God speaks to us. How does the Westminster Confession capture this definition for us? And it does it so well, and I'm going to quote it for you. Um, Christ executes the office of a prophet in revealing to the church in all ages by a spirit and word the whole counsel of God in all things concerning edification and salvation. So how does he execute the office of a prophet? In revealing to the church in all ages by his spirit and word the whole counsel of God in all things concerning edification and salvation. So we notice Christ is both the subject of prophecy as well as the object of prophecy. So he is our prophet. Secondly, we also say Christ is our priest. In what way is Christ our priest? Right? The um, Bible says, Hebrews chapter 2 reminds us that the Messiah too was going to be a uh, priest. In what way would he function as a priest? Hebrews 2, 7, therefore he had to be like his brothers in every respect. In other words, Christ had to be incarnate. He had to enter brotherhood with us so that he might become a what? Merciful and faithful high priest in service of God to make propitiation. Anyone heard of this term before? Propitiation. What does it mean, propitiation? Anyone? Somebody who removes the wrath of God, somebody who appeases the wrath of God and satisfies the justice of God, right? So he became our first merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to do what? To make propitiation. He became our atoning sacrifice that, sa that satisfied God's wrath for us. Uh, to make propitiation for the sins of people. Because of his atoning sacrifice, he removes the obstacle of sin and makes fellowship with God possible, right? Now, we also notice uh, that the Messiah will also be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, can anyone guess what is the most quoted Old Testament passage in the entire New Testament? Psalm 110. The most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament 
is Psalm 110. Why? Because it really captures for us two truths that the Messiah was going to be a priest and the Messiah is going to be king. And this uh, very important uh, uh, passage captures the truth that the Messiah was going to be both prophet and king, uh, priest and king rather, priest in the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110 verse 4, and the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 5.10 being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Why is this important? We notice in Hebrews, and we don't have time to read the entire uh, chapter in Hebrews, so I'm going to, uh, uh, chapter 7 in Hebrews, which I like to read to sort of uh, highlight a few things. <coughs> in Hebrews chapter 7, the writer belabors the point that the uh, priesthood of Christ is in the order of Melchizedek. Number one. Number two, the priesthood of Christ is a superior priesthood. And number three, his offering is a superior offspring. He uses the illustration of Abraham in uh, Hebrews chapter 7, where he basically says uh, uh, the priesthood of Christ was that of the order of Melchizedek. In other words, it was a superior priesthood, right? We had the Aaronic priesthood, then you had the Melchizedekan priesthood, so to speak. The Aaronic priesthood came after the Melchizedekan priesthood. So the writer of Hebrews belabors the point that the priesthood of Christ was the order of Melchizedek and therefore superior to the Aaronic order or the, or the Levitical priesthood. Why? Because when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, the writer of Hebrews says that Levi was in his what? Loins, right? So indirectly, Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek. It's always the, uh, uh, the inferior who pays tithes to the superior. So Abraham paying tithes to, uh, paid tithes to Melchizedek, and in doing so, indirectly, Levi, because he was in the loins of Abraham, says the writer, paid tithes to Melchizedek. And therefore, he, the writer of Hebrews belabors a point that the uh, priesthood of Christ was of a superior order. He also talks about the fact that the ministry of Christ is of a superior order as well, because why? What was the problem with the Old Testament priests? They kept dying. And so here we have Christ who offers himself as a living sacrifice, and this sacrifice is what? Once and for all. So it's a superior sacrifice and a superior ministry because here we have Jesus, whoever lives to save and to intercede, says the writer of Hebrews. So all this to say, Christ executes the office of a priest in his once for all offspring, once, for, once uh, offering himself a sacrifice without spot to God to be a reconciliation for the sins of the people and in making continual intercession for them. So very quickly, Look at the last point here, Christ as our king. How is Christ our king? We notice that the, the Bible talks about the fact that the Messiah too was going to be a king, right? The Messiah was going to be a king. Isaiah chapter 9, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and of the peace there will be no end. On the throne of David over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and, ev and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So we know that the Messiah was going to be a king in the line of who? King David, right? He was going to be a descendant of King David and he was going to, uh, uh, he was going to rule, r rule, as it were, from the throne of David. We notice that um, uh, in the case of Jesus, uh, when he was uh, uh, actually charged, when he was brought in front of Pilate, do you know what charge he was brought with? That he claimed to be what? A king, right? When uh, Pilate asked him, you are, a, are you a king? Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you're right in saying I'm the king of the Jews, to use the NIV translation. And of course, um, he asked him the, that, that famous question, what is the truth? And without waiting for an answer, Pilate leaves. And uh, George MacDonald very famously said, to give truth to him who loves it not is to give more multiplied reasons for misinterpretation. Pilate walked away after, ask, after asking, asking Jesus, what is the truth? The truth is that he was indeed the king and he was the one who indeed brought the kingdom of God or ushered the kingdom of God. Very quickly. Oh, just what was the end of that quote again? Um, George MacDonald very famously said, uh, to give truth to him who loves it not is to give more multiplied reasons for misinterpretation. Hmm. Now, how, does, uh, how do we think of Christ as our uh, king. Here's how the Westminster Confession says Christ is our king. And very quickly, I want to point out to you the participles in this definition, and we'll read it, and then we'll bring this uh, our time to a close. I'm almost out of time. 
Um, Christ executes the office of a king in calling out, notice the participles, in calling out of the world a people to himself, giving them officers, laws and censures by which he visibly governs them, in bestowing saving grace upon his elect, rewarding their obedience and correcting them for their sins, preserving and supporting them under all their temptations and sufferings and restraining, uh, temptations and suffering, restraining and overcoming all their enemies and powerfully ordering all things for his glory and their good, and also in taking vengeance on the rest who know not God and, to obey, no, and obey not the gospel. So we know that Jesus Christ is indeed our King. Uh, he is the one who rules over us, who protects us, and who basically is the one who's going to come and bring his kingdom once and for all, as it were, on this earth, as uh, Revelation reminds us. Now, um, we know that Jesus Christ now is uh, 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 reigning. He is at God's right hand. He is the everlasting King. In fact, isn't this how we uh, think about uh, him when we sing uh, uh, Handel's Messiah, right? Um, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever, what? Hallelujah. So Jesus Christ is indeed our King. So the Messiah is uh, our prophet, he is our priest, and he is our King. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.